right, so we're finishing host defenses one, and I might get started on classification. That's only about a 10 or 15 minute lesson. Any questions? Let me blow this up a little. Can you guys see this? Yes. Thank you. So we have yet to talk about interferons. Interferons are proteins that are active against a variety of different kinds of viruses. And there's one type of interferon which is a little different. And we'll talk about them, although the, the third type we'll only talk about briefly. Uh, there's three kinds of interferon. They're called alpha interferon, beta, and gamma interferons. Alpha and beta interferons are made by cells when the cells are infected by a virus. Excuse me. Gamma interferon is a little different. It's made by lymphocytes to activate macrophages. And I'm not going to discuss gamma interferon any further. Any questions? So we will discuss alpha and beta interferons. <clears throat> they are made by cells when they are infected by a virus. And we've talked about viruses now, so you understand that. Let me see if I can blow this up a little. There, that's better. So this cell gets infected by a virus, and the virus is using the cell to replicate more viruses. Well, one of the last things this vir uh, cell, the host cell, does is it turns on the interferon gene and transcribes it and translates it. And the interferon is turned on when the cell is infected with a virus. What the interferon gene is, is a message to neighboring cells. And so the protein is translated, and then it's secreted from the cell. And what it is, is a message to neighboring cells saying, guys, I'm infected by a virus. You'd better get ready for a viral onslaught because the virus is replicating in my cell. Any question about that? What the message does to this cell, a neighboring cell that receives the interferon, is the message goes into the nucleus and it turns on a gene that is not normally uh, turned on. So uh, that gene is transcribed and translated and it, like I said, that, that gene is not normally made. Uh, what it makes is, is an inactive antiviral protein. And this protein remains inactive in this cell until this cell becomes infected with the virus. And then the virus itself activates the antiviral protein. We're not going to talk about how. And rather than this cell um, being used to make new virions, this cell, the antiviral protein, what it does is it turns off protein translation in this cell. Okay, what happens if this cell has no protein translation going on? What happens to a cell if it stops protein translation? It can't replicate. The virus can't replicate, that's true, but what will happen to the cell? It'll die? Yeah, it's eventually going to die. So what the antiviral protein is trying to do is hold off viral replication by shutting down protein translation. That means the new virions cannot get made. And it's trying to shut down... Uh, viral replication 
for long enough, meaning shutting down protein translation, for long enough for the virus to get cleared from the cell. And then it's hoping to turn on protein translation when the virus is cleared from the cell and then the cell will not die. Okay? Do you see where there can be some problems here? And that is if it doesn't shut down protein translation long enough, the virus won't be cleared and then the virus will start replicating in the cell once protein translation occurs. And I haven't talked about it, but the cell has uh, various mechanisms for clearing itself from uh, viruses. Uh, one thing is, is that the cells has DNases and RNases and they just go in and they cleave uh, DNA and RNA that are in the cytoplasm. And that's one way a cell can get rid of viruses. Okay, you cleave their genome and then you cleared the virus from the cell. And uh, if the cell holds back on protein translation for too long, the cell is going to die. So the antiviral protein is a gamble and the cell is gambling with its life that it can clear itself of the virus before uh, turning on protein translation, and then the cell will recover. Okay, so do you see how the interferon works? It sends a message from this cell to that cell saying, guys, I'm infected, you'd better get ready for a viruses. And then the, uh, the uh, interferon turns on the antiviral protein in this gene, and then that starts a gamble in this cell. Once it becomes infected, the antiviral protein doesn't work, isn't activated until the cell is infected with the virus. But once it becomes infected with the virus, the cell shuts down protein translation. The virus can't replicate. And hopefully the cell can clear itself of viruses. And then the protein translation will turn on and the cell will recover, okay? If the antiviral protein is on for too long, and protein translation happens too long, I mean, hope protein translation shut down happens for too long, this cell will die. And if uh, the protein translation isn't, the stop to protein translation isn't long enough, the virus will replicate, and then the, as the virus replicates, the cell will likely die. And let me go back up to here and talk about the cell that made interferon. It was infected with a virus. Most likely, this cell is going to die because the virus is going to replicate and then lyse this cell to release the viruses If it's a budding life cycle virus, it will only be shed at low numbers, in which case the cell will not die. All right, any questions about any of this? For those of you who play poker, you know about how gambling is, especially when you're gambling for a large amount of money. And that's what the cell is doing with the antiviral protein. There's no questions. Let's move on and talk about complement. The complement is another defense that the body has, and what it is is a series of proteins that helps defend the body from infection. Uh, I guess what I want to talk about is say that it's an important set of proteins that are found in the blood and the serum. Is there a question? Uh, the complement proteins activate as a cascade 
when one protein gets activated, it activates other proteins, and then pretty much the whole complement proteins are activated. It's, and a cascade is something like one stone falling down uh, the steep cliff of the mountain, and that stone hits other stones, which hits other stones, and they all start falling down the mountain. And pretty soon you have an avalanche of stones falling down the mountain. And that's how the complement uh, proteins get activated. One gets activated, and it activates others, and then they activate others, and then they're uh, essentially all of them are activated. So the complement proteins are nine proteins found in the blood and they're given really creative nines. They're labeled C1 through C9. So obviously C2, C3, etc. up to C9. And some of them can be cleaved into smaller portions and when they're cleaved, the smaller portions are active and they get together to form new products. Okay, any questions about that? So the complement proteins do a large number of things in the body once they become activated. Some of them are the complement proteins or at least a, uh, a portion of one of them can increase blood vessel permeability, and then that can speed up the arrival of uh, uh, white blood cells to the region, and then the repair proteins to the region. And then later on, it can also speed up the uh, uh, development of uh, uh, proteins to the body. But uh, are we going to talk about that? Yeah, we'll talk about that in the next lesson, uh, where it speeds up uh, the production of antibodies to the site of an infection, but that happens late in an infection. Uh, but it can also speed up the uh, delivery of the complement proteins to a region by increasing the vessel permeability. Uh, one of the complement proteins can act as a chemo uh, tactic attraction factor, attracting phagocytes to the region of an infection. Uh, one of the uh, complement protein or the protein part can act as a opsonization where the complement protein or the portion of it can actually coat a microbe making it more likely to be phagocytized by a white blood cell. And then most of the complement proteins uh, act on cytolysis where they, they bind to a uh, bacteria cell that is infecting the body and they uh, uh, create holes in the membrane or in the outer membrane of a gram-negative cell and that will eventually kill the pathogen and gram-negative cells are particularly vulnerable to uh, cytolysis by the complement proteins because they have their exposed outer membrane which will be uh, uh, attacked by the complement proteins. And this is also true for some human parasites that lack a cell wall, like amoebas. The complement proteins can put a hole in their cell membrane, and uh, they will be very susceptible to the complement proteins. Any question about any of that? So the complement protein mainly acts by two pathways. Uh, it can act in other ways, but they're minor, much more minor than the two uh, pathways I'm going to talk about. And so let's talk about the two major ways that the complement proteins get activated. The first is the classical pathway, and it's called the classical pathway because uh, it's the first one that was discovered. Uh, early immunologists were studying uh, antibodies and they noticed that there was the proteins in the blood that help the antibodies act. And what happens is the antibodies, which is something that we're going to talk about in the next lesson. This is a specific uh, defense of the body against uh, one pathogen.
the antibodies bind to the antigens on a pathogen. An antigen is really just an external cell molecule that the body can recognize as foreign. Any question about any of that? Anyways, the body makes antibodies to the antigens of a pathogen, and then the antibodies bind to the pathogen. Well, the antibodies can bind to complement proteins, and when a complement protein binds to the antibodies, that activates that complement protein, and then that activates another complement protein, which then activates a complement C3, which does a number of things. One of the things it can do is when C3 gets activated, a portion of it can uh, act as opsonization, and that is it binds to the pathogen, making it more likely to be engulfed by a, a white blood cell. Uh, another portion of C3 can act as inflammation, so it can uh, create inflammation in the site of an infection. And then C3 eventually activates C5. A portion of that can be involved also in inflammation, increasing inflammation where there's a site of uh, an infection. And then C5 activates the other uh, complement proteins, meaning C6 through C9, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And that uh, creates the membrane attack complex, putting a hole in the cell membrane, or for a gram-negative cell, a hole in the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell, and that results in lysis or destruction of the cell. Okay, any question about the classical pathway, how the complement proteins get activated? The other major way the complement proteins get activated is that C3 itself can break apart into C3A and C3B. And this just happens at low numbers in the blood where every once in a while C3 breaks into C3A and C3B. Well, C3B is the important one in activating the uh, the alternate pathway of the complement activation, and that is C3B can directly bind to a pathogen. And then that gets stabilized. We're not going to talk about how and why, but it gets stabilized by um, endotoxin and glycoproteins on the uh, uh, gram cell. Toxins are only on gram-negative cells, but the point is, is that there's different things on bacteria that can stabilize 3,3B, and so if that binds for a long time, C3B can then activate the complement cascade, uh, activating C5, which will then activate the lower meaning C6 through C9 complement proteins, and then uh, creating the membrane attack complex, putting a hole in the, in the uh, um, membrane of a bacteria. Okay? The important part is, is that the alternate pathway acts differently in getting started from the classical pathway, meaning there are two pathways to begin with, but that they later, on the activation of C5, become the same pathway. Okay, is that uh, clear? Um, why you need stabilization of the C3B, and there's a couple of factors that can stabilize it. I didn't even talk about There's various factors in the blood that can help stabilize the binding of C3B to a pathogen. Is, is that if C3B is floating around in the cell and it gets on your cell, uh, 
that would mean that the alternate pathway gets activated on your cell. So we don't want C3B to be stabilized on your cell because the membrane attack complex will create a hole in the cell membrane of your cell. And so that's why the alternate pathway needs to be stabilized. And like I said, there's various factors that stabilize it, just whatever the, uh, the, uh, the outer portions of a bacteria tend to stabilize the binding of C3B to a bacteria cell. And there's various factors in the blood that stabilize C3B. So that this happens for a long period of time, and then that will create a hole in the pathogen. If C3B binds to your cell, the stabilization doesn't happen, so C3B is likely to fall off before the membrane attack complex happens to your cell. And another thing that can happen that can uh, save your cell is that when C3B binds to your cell, we always have endocytosis happening in our cells. An endocytosis can bring in C3B inside the cell, and then that cell will not be attacked by the complement cascade. Any question about that? All right. So let's look at an overview of the complement cascade. We're going to look at it with the classical pathway. Uh, although we could use the alternate pathway to get it started. It, it Later, once this becomes active, it becomes the same pathway. But in the classical pathway, antibodies bind to the pathogen, and that's just what antibodies do. They're made by the host to react to a pathogen. And uh, the complement protein C1 can bind to the antibodies. And when C1 excuse me, is bind, bound to the antibodies, C1 becomes active. C1, when it's not bound to the antibodies, is not active. Is that clear? So C1 by itself is not active. But when it binds to the antibodies, it's activated. And what C1 does is it, it cleaves C2 and C4. Is that clear? C1, and you don't need to memorize this. So I will tell you what you need to know in, when I'm all done here. So when C2 gets cut, it breaks up into C2A and C2B. And where do I have C2B being discussed? Oh, C2B goes over here, and C2A goes over here. So let's talk about C2A gets together with C4B, and C4B, C4 gets cleaved also by C1 into C4A and C4B. Well, C4B gets together with C2A, and that cleaves C3 into C3A and C3B. We've already talked a little bit about C3B. It can bind to a pathogen and then act on this, an opsonin, okay? Activating the uh, complement. Excuse me. Actually, that's not an opsonin, but it sort of is a sort of opsonin. It's binding to the pathogen and then activating the alternate pathway, which we're not going to talk about. But I'm just pointing out that C3B, when it gets activated, can bind to the pathogen and then activate the complement cascade. A C3B also acts as an opsonin, so when it binds to a pathogen, Besides activating the alternate pathway, it can act as a bridge for having a white blood cell 
uh, attacked the, the pathogen, meaning that white blood cells themselves can bind to the pathogen and then phagocytize it, but C3B speeds that process up because it directly binds to the pathogen and directly binds to the white blood cell. And so it acts as a bridge between the white blood cell and the pathogen. Any questions about that? And I think we briefly discussed anapsonin last time, that that's what it does. C3B has another role, and it can be, get together with C4A and C2, C2B and C3B to make an enzyme which activates C5, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I need to talk about C3A. So when C3 gets activated, it makes C3B and C3A. C3B does a lot of things, right? It makes an enzyme here. It acts as an epsonin, and then it activates the alternate uh, complement pathway. C3A acts as a chemotaxis factor, attracting white blood cells to the area of an infection, and then it also acts as a chemical of inflammation, so it inflames the area where C3A is, and that's the area where you have uh, the infection. Any question about any of that? All right, so we mentioned that C3B gets together with C2B and C4A to make an enzyme, and what this enzyme does is it cleaves C5, activating C5. C5A acts as a chemotactic factor, an inflammation factor, attracting white blood cells to the region and inflaming the area, and that's very similar to C3A. C5B binds to the membrane or the outer membrane of a bacteria cell, and obviously it's only the outer membrane of a gram-negative cell. And what C5B does <clears throat> is it calls down C6, which calls down C7, which calls down C8, which calls down C9, and then C9 calls down other C9s, and C9s together put a hole in the membrane of a cell. And this can be either the cell membrane or in a gram-negative cell, it can be the, the outer membrane. And then if it's the cell membrane, the cytoplasm will leak out and then the cell will die. And if it's the outer membrane, um, I've got a picture here, the cell will die also. And all these dark uh, spots on this cell uh, are being caused by the membrane attack complex. And uh, I think this is a eukaryotic cell because it's awfully big. So that means that uh, the cytoplasm is leaking out each of these black little holes. And obviously you only need one to kill the cell. Any questions about that? All right, so in summary, the complement cascade can be activated by the specific uh, uh, host defense or a non-specific defense. The specific defense is where the classical pathway gets activated, uh, complement cascade gets activated by binding to antibodies which are bound to the pathogen. The non-specific response is when the alternate pathway activates the complement uh, cascade. And we'll talk more about antibodies in our next lesson. Are there any questions? There should be one. And that is, what of this do you need to know? You don't need to memorize this 
picture here on how the complement proteins work, but you do need to be able to explain it. So if I ask you a question like, how does 6,5-A work? You have to be able to tell me when I give you this picture, okay? Any questions about that? And I'll probably not ask you anything as simple as C5A because that only does two things, but I could do ask you a question about how C5B acts. And you should say it calls down C6, which calls down C7, which calls down C8, which calls down C9, which calls down other C9s, which form a hole in the membrane of a cell. Any questions about that? Okay? So you don't have to memorize this picture, but you do need to be able to explain it if I give you this picture. Any questions about that? You probably should know the classical pathway and the alternate pathway, how they get activated. C3B for the alternate, the antibodies activate the classical pathway. And then uh, uh, the important thing is that C5 gets activated, which causes the membrane attack uh, complex, meaning the hole in the uh, pathogen. What do C1 and C2 do? C2? Uh, C1 gets active only in the classical pathway. C1 binds to antibodies and then when it does that it becomes active and it cleaves C2 and C4. That's what C1 does. Okay? Did you have another question? So the alternative pathway starts with uh, C... C3B. So okay, C3 thank you. itself can break apart every so often, not often, but rarely. And so C3B is active and it will bind to the membrane of a pathogen. And then that gets stabilized. You only need to know that that C3 binding to a pathogen gets stabilized. Um, I did mention that with C3 being around in the body, that's a dangerous thing because if it binds to your cell, it can create the complement cascade on your cell. And so that's why we don't have much C3B floating around in the body. Okay? All right. Any questions about host defenses one, which are everything we kind of talked about are non-specific defenses. We talked about the first line of defense and the second line of defense. And I do want to point out that although the complement pathway can act as a non-specific defense, when it's activated with the alternate pathway, it's totally non-specific. When it's activated by antibodies, that antibodies are a specific defense. The complement proteins are non-specific defense, though. Okay? Any questions about that? Any questions about interferon, fever, inflammation? If not, let me take a look at the time here. Oh, we've got a long ways to go, so. Let's go ahead and at least talk about classification. This will only be a 15 minute um, a little bit away. This will only be a 15 minute lesson and we're going to talk about the classification of prokaryotes in a little bit more detail. We've already talked a little bit about this when we were on chapter 1 and chapter 10. Chapter 10 was classification. We never
spoke much more about it other than the DNA, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. So let's talk about the classification of prokaryotes. And let me see if I can blow that up just a little bit. Uh, classification of bacteria is to seek to describe the diversity of bacterial species by naming and grouping organisms based on their similarities. And of course, that's true of any classification scheme of anything, but we're talking only about the bacteria. Initially, bacteria were classified on the basis of their cell structure, their cellular metabolism, and differences in the cell components, such as differences in DNA, the fatty acids, the pigments, and the antigens. But as you know, when you look at the cell structure for actually all of the prokaryotes, they're pretty similar, right? There's not a whole lot to the prokaryotes. There can be some different cell metabolism and then different components in the cells. We didn't really talk about it much, but we did mention that peptidoglycan is found in the bacteria and it's not found in the archaeobacteria and there's other uh, components found in the bacteria and we're not talking about it. So you could, especially when we're talking about uh, metabolic differences or chemical differences, you could start classifying the bacteria with that. And that schemes did allow the identification and the classification of the different bacterial strains and species, but it was subjective. And it was unclear whether these differences represented variation between distinct species or between strains of the same species. And there are arguments, like people used to argue, oh, this bacteria belongs in this family. Another said, no, that bacteria belonged in that family. Okay, any questions about that? And it was subjective, and that's why there were arguments. It's sort of like uh, we discussed with the kingdom. There's no definition for what is a kingdom. And... When you're talking about the algae, which are photosynthetic and produce oxygen, are they a protist, because most of the protists we talked about are single cell, or are they a uh, plant? And people would argue about that in the old days, because uh, uh, the kelp are very long algae, which look and function very similar to plants. Now that might be different for the single-celled algae and that looked much more like a protus uh, because the protus, like the uh, bacteria, I mean the human pathogens are uh, uh, single-celled uh, protus. And so the single-celled algae did look like that. The point is it was subjective where they went. And some people would say, Ah, the algae, they belong with the plants. And other people would say, no, the algae belong with the protists. And like I said, the protists were not, and still are not, clearly defined. Meaning there is no one definition for what a protist is. Okay? And today, what we call a protist is a eukaryote, which is not an animal, not a plant, and not a fungi. So it's a eukaryote that's not one of those three. And you can imagine that it's not a very homogeneous group because there are different, there were different evolutionary pathways followed by the different protists, okay? And you can split the protists into more than one kingdom. We're not gonna do that, but uh, uh, some people do that. Any questions about any of that? So the bacteria were split that way and there were arguments about where they went because how the uh, uh, classification went, it was subjective. And there was uncertainty 
And then on top of that, there was lateral gene transfer between unrelated species, where species picked up DNA, sometimes more than just one gene, sometimes only a gene, from lateral gene transfer. And you remember we talked about that earlier in chapter 8, where one gene moves from one species into another in the same generation. And there's various ways that can happen. Uh, the simplest way is by a plasmid, but it could be from even a virus, although viruses usually only do that within the same species. And so vi uh, bacteria, which were not closely related, now picked up properties that were related. Um, I can't for the life of me, think of anything, but we can talk about like penicillin G resistance, where two bacteria strains develop penicillin G resistance, but one of the strains didn't evolve it on its own. It picked it up by lateral gene transfer. Okay, so the point is that very different species could have similar morphology or a metabolism because of lateral gene transfer. And that threw off, obviously, the classification scheme. All right, any question about any of that? So to overcome the subjectivity and uncertainty, modern black bacterial classification systems emphasize molecular systematics using genetic techniques such as DNA sequencing especially of uh, regions of DNA that have not gone under extensive lateral gene transfer. And usually what they do is they sequence the rRNA genes. The advantage for doing the rRNA is these genes are in all living organisms. So you can make a um, phy phylogenetic tree for everything. Like if you were to do the DNA sequencing of the eye color in humans, well, that would only work really for animals because no other species even has eyes, okay? But if you do it for rRNA genes, every species has it. And then for some reason, the rRNA genes have not undergone lateral gene transfer probably because every species already had an rRNA gene, so they didn't need to get that gene from lateral uh, gene transfer. Okay? Any question about that? And then you can uh, develop the, the uh, uh, classification scheme based on the sequence of rRNA genes. And that's what the modern bacterial classification scheme is. And that's how we have the domains defined on the sequence of the DNA for those species. And we're looking at uh, genes like rRNA to do that classification scheme. Surprisingly, the adoption of this modern classification system has been slow among some microbiologists, especially older microbiologists like me, who in my age, uh, DNA sequencing was not around. I was in college when DNA sequencing of species was discovered, okay? So when I was in college, people sequenced DNA to the different species and then they discovered that there were three domains. And that came as a shock to the biologists because they thought the archaeobacteria and the bacteria were the same, same kingdom. They didn't have the domains then, so we'll say the same kingdom. And uh, uh, we had no idea that they were so different in their DNA. Anyways, the older my microbiologists have been reluctant to accept this classification scheme because they didn't want to throw out their old cherished classification scheme, even if it was subjective. 
and flat out wrong. We still wanted to keep at least parts of it. And the Burgie's Manual, there's been a rewrite of it. So what would that be? The third edition of Burgie's Manual? And it's been in, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, debate and hasn't been published for 12 years because the people are arguing about what they should accept for the classification scheme. And certain people, and apparently are on the board of Burgie's Manual, are not accepting the modern bacterial classification system where you're only looking at DNA. They're keeping parts of the older system. And so the publication for the Burgie's Manual has been tied up in arguments. It's now for over 12 or 13 years, okay? So they're in a rewrite and they've never put out the third edition because of arguments, okay? Meaning that some people aren't accepting the modern classification system. Uh, the term bacteria, let's talk a little bit about the original uh, classification system. The term bacteria was traditionally applied to all microscopic single-celled prokaryotes. It wasn't until the 1970s, and that was actually late in the 1970s, where people started uh, sequencing prokaryotes and discovered that the bacteria, sorry, I've got the old term here, eubacteria, and the archaeobacteria were, uh, there I've got the new terms here, the bacteria and the archaea were uh, very different from each other in their DNA sequence, and they evolved independently from a common ancestor. And then when we look at the sequence of the archaea and the eukaryotes, we discovered that the archaea are actually a little closer to the eukaryotes than the archaea are to the bacteria. Now that difference is slight, but it is true. The archaea are a little closer to the eukaryotes in their DNA sequence than they are to the bacteria. And here I'll show you the tree of life the archaea and the eukaryotes had a common ancestor for a short period of time before they diverged. And that makes the archaea and the eukaryotes more closely related than the archaea are to the bacteria, even though these two are prokaryotes and this is a eukaryote. Now that difference is slight. This timeline isn't that big, uh, but these two are a little closer together in their sequence of DNA. And let's come back to where I was. And then when we sequenced it, we got the three domains, and every species in each domain is much more similar to another species in its domain than a species in another domain. And that's the modern classification system of biology. By the way, I have accepted this modern classification system. And it makes it easy to classify each species of bacteria because all you have to do is sequence the species. And we're looking at the RNA gene, for example, uh, because like, where do we have that here? It's not shown here, but the, uh, the, uh, sorry, I'm losing it. The chloroplasts and the mitochondria, when we sequence the DNA, and we're looking at the rRNA genes, we find that the sequence belongs in the domain bacteria, the sequence of the genes in the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, do not belong in the domain eukaryota. Any question about that? And we talked about that earlier. Um, 
The identification of bacteria species is important because it's particularly relevant to medicine where the correct treatment is determined by the bacterial species causing an infection and sometimes you can determine the exact strain by sequencing the bacteria. And someday in the future, I think in the clinic, that is how they will identify bacteria. Most of the times when they're identifying bacteria in the clinic, they're, they're performing the biochemical tests which you use in the lab. So at the moment, we're still identifying bacteria species from their biochemical tests. Any question about that? Which you have done in your virtual lab. Anyways, the uh, need to identify human pathogens and identify them correctly was a major impetus for the development of techniques to identify bacteria and uh, come up with the phylogenetic tree of life where we know there are three domains. Okay? All right, any question about any of that? So if ever they discover a new species, we just sequence the species and then we know where that species will be on the sequence of its DNA for which domain it belongs to. Now, How long does I, it usually take? Sorry, to can you repeat that a little louder? How long does it usually take to sequence the species? Uh, if it's a bacteria cell and they only have like uh, 2,000 genes, and you don't need to do all of them, you only need to just, uh, sequence the RNA genes. Uh, so that can be done in a day. And I don't know how long that takes, but let's say probably just a couple of hours. And it might be as little as two hours. Assuming that your lab set up to sequence things. Okay. And then you can give your report to the uh, clinic in just a couple of hours. You can also look at the... Uh, uh, I don't know, phylogenetic relationships to look at the phylogenetic diversity. And so when we look at the phylogenetic diversity, we notice that the bacteria, shown in blue, is the most diverse domain on the planet. They occupy the most niches. And when we look at how they've evolved their DNA, their DNA is most diverse. Any question about that? The bacteria are the most numerous domain on the planet, and they are the most genetically diverse. Any question about that? Let me take a look. I still don't have the uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts in here, but they fall in the domain uh, bacteria. And you'll notice here the gram positives are not very diverse. Most of them are all right here in just one, what do you call that, one prong of the bacteria. So most of these others, I, I don't know all of them, like the cyanobacteria, I don't know if it's a gram positive or a gram negative, but most of these are gram negatives and you can see that they're very diverse okay and the proteobacteria probably should be broken into more than one group because it looks like it's one two three at least four maybe even five uh, uh, prongs of the bacteria and then the second most diverse organism are the eukaryotes Involving the protozoa all over here, and if you put the algae in with the protozoa, although I wonder if this is an algae and that's an algae, or those are all algae, I don't know. Uh, and then the plants, the slime molds, the animals, and the fungi. And you can see that we put all of these over here in the kingdom protus, and then there's the plants, 
And don't ask me where we put the slime molds because when we separated the fungi and animals and plants, uh, all the rest are protists, so the slime molds are protists. And as you can see, uh, you can separate this based on the DNA into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different kingdoms. And we're not going to do that. Okay? And then the, uh, the domain archaea are the least diverse domain on the planet. And I guess that's all you need to know about them. Uh, they have not been as successful as the eukaryotes or the uh, bacteria. Any question about any of that? Okay, if not, I will see you at 2.30. All right?